Hello and welcome to the F1 Feeder Series podcast, your guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single-seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and after covering Formula 2 and Formula 3 last week as they head into their summer breaks, this week we're going to check out what's happening in the summer slowdown in some other feeder series. To help me do that, we've enlisted help from two drivers in the best places to detail what's happening in their lofty positions at the top of their respective championships. First, let me introduce Freca Racer for Prema, a member of the Ferrari Driver Academy and the longtime championship leader of his championship. Welcome to the podcast, Dino Boganovic. How are you today? Thank you. All good. Um, nice to be here. Are you looking forward to having a few weeks off or is this something you just want to get this championship won and done and dusted? No, you know, I mean, um, it's, been a, it's been a long season. It's been a, obviously a really good season so far. And I think uh, everybody deserves a, a bit of a break now. It's not going to be as busy as in the beginning. In the beginning, it was really busy with the, the Monaco weekend and then straight away Paul Ricard. So... Yeah, it's, it's nice to have a little break, but I think in about one week, I will get a bit bored again. <laughs> I think both of you, and I'll have to do the introduction in a second for anybody who's listening and doesn't know who else on the podcast, but both of you are going to just get, I don't know if the right word is, but um, missing silverware, you know, like it's, you've been getting trophies handed to you pretty much every week. But let me continue the Swedish theme and introduce that second guest because I'm delighted to say there's compatriot to Dino joining us. He's a GB3 race winning driver racing for Fortec and with his incredible consistency in getting to the podium in every single round, he now leads the standings. Hello, Joel Granfors. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Pleasure. yeah, I've seen some, some podcasts uh, in the past, so glad to be on one. Oh, wow. I don't know if I usually get that. I feel like now you've been judging me in the past, but uh, <laughs> welcome to the podcast and a terrific season for you so far as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty decent start, obviously, with the new cars in, in GB3 Championship compared to last year. There's a lot of testing going down before the first couple of rounds, just, you know, to try to understand the cars as good as possible. And then uh, the first round also, you know, the pretty decent weekend was Luke Browning, who is uh, my biggest championship rival as well. We had a, you know, an awesome weekend there where they won both the, both the first races. And then uh, I think it crashed out in the last one, the reverse one, but it's a tough track to overtake, so they didn't lose out too many points there. But, uh, but yeah, it's been, a, it's been a good year so far, and I hope you can just keep it up for the last uh, two rounds. Yeah, it's been a terrific season for you. Lots of lots of trophies. And, um, well, I bet you wish you were racing at Silverstone all the time. But we'll come on to that in a little while. Finally, after a brief cameo from our America's editor last week, who spoke about F4 Brazil, I'm delighted to introduce to the podcast the debut appearance of Maria Clara Castro, the F1 feeder series editor for F4 Brazil, also F4 Argentina and F4 North and Central America, Welcome to the podcast, Maria. That's a lot of series you have to cover. Yeah, tough job. But firstly, hello, everyone who are listening to us and watching us. Hello, Jim. Hello, Joel. Hey, hello, Dino. And yeah, I mean, it's a tough job, but I mean, I love this, this sport, so it's amazing. I had an amazing weekend, but we got to that later. Yeah, we, uh, we're we going to speak about that in a little bit. So a good teaser there. I will uh, I'll talk about that in a little while, keep everybody hooked in. But before we get into the podcast fully, a quick reminder to like, comment and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. If you don't have time to listen or watch each week, you can still find some great short videos on our channel with our best bits. And if you're listening to the audio-only version, please leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're using. You can leave a rating on Spotify and review us on Apple Podcasts. We're up to 4.7 stars on Spotify. Thank you very much. And we have a new review from Selfish Apple 561 on Apple, who states that, and this is a quote from Selfish Apple 561 the podcast is so, so good, and that it is the capital letters the way to get feeder series news they're not even my words thank you so much selfish apple 561 
If you, listener, want to have your review read out on the podcast, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts as well. If not, dropping a rating is just as appreciated. Thank you to everybody who does rate us. It really does help us out. We have to start with Frecker, considering the guest we have on this week. Ever since the first race at Monza, you've pretty much been the only story in town, Dino. How's the season going from your perspective? And have you ran out of words that are synonymous with good? You know, I use it quite often, but it's been an amazing start of the season. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't really know what else I can say. Um, it started off just brilliant with the first weekend, getting a, getting the first victory of the season, feeling like it was uh, something that was missing. And, you know, when you win once or twice, you know how to win. And uh, it sort of becomes easier because, you know, it's it's all in the head. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's how it started going after. I mean, um, things were going our way as well um, sometimes. And we were just, uh, I mean, we have just been quick. We have uh, been taking the right steps at the right time. Uh, and uh, you know, we've just been making the right decision, the decisions. So no, I mean, uh, I think with the team, uh, with the work we have done during the during the winter season, during the off season, and we could already see a glimpse of it in the end of last season in Monza, in the Mugello, where we were fighting for pole, and we took pole in Monza, fighting for the victory in the last race of the season. I think it was a a glimpse of what was coming for this year and a little um let's say intro maybe <laughs> for this pre- year a little think, preview uh, yeah and uh, i think it's it's just been really good um obviously it was two weekends where it was a bit more difficult uh, a little bit difficult in zandvoort but especially budapest but to then come back to um to spam with the um, with a win straight away was um was much needed before the before the summer break. When you say we Dino, are you talking about like your not your team Prima, but you as in you and your mechanics and the people surrounding you? Is that who you're referring to when you say we are doing so much better? Because it's not the entire Prima team. You're obviously doing very well, but you are in a completely different league from the rest of the team and the rest of the championship. No, I mean I'm all the people I work with, and I've said it pretty much since starting that the people I work with, the people that are helping me, we are doing this together. It's not the uh, I'm winning, we are winning. If I'm losing, we are losing. It's uh, it's quite a famous uh, saying, but I mean, that's how it is. And I've always been saying that we are doing this. If we are, we are having a um, difficult balance in the car, if we are having a good balance in the car, it's because we have put it together. We have put the car together. We have, uh, let's say, um, engineered, engineered the car together. Then the driving bit, obviously, it's me. But talking uh, from an overview, we is my engineer, my mechanics, my manager, my you know family, everybody that's behind me. That, uh, that that's we we doing this uh, together. It's a lovely sentiment and. Uh... I think it's easy to overlook. There's a lot more in motorsport than just a person in the cockpit, isn't there? So I, I really like that you say that. And you talked about last year briefly as well. And it's almost chalk and cheese, as I'd say, as a British person, between how your seasons have gone. They're so different. And this year, silverware constantly. Last year, not so much, let's say. Is that just as simple as becoming that second year driver? Because Last season, when I saw you in other interviews, you had the confidence going into it. You know, you, you were thinking, yeah, I can have a really good time. You did well in Imola um, the year before. And thinking, yeah, it's going to be really good. But 2021 wasn't, I presume, uh, the level you hoped for. But 2022 is just so different. What, what changed? Was it your off-season? Is it just getting more experience with the car? No, as I said before, I think you could see that um, during the season we were making progress, we were making steps with the car. Um, I was becoming more confident in the car and you could see it on the results as well. And uh, it's not that it was from 
from uh, night to day uh, during last season to this season because we could already see from last season in the end of the year that the results were coming. So I think it was a bit difficult in the beginning uh, coming to a new car and such a competitive championship because, um, you know, everyone, everybody wants to drive a um, competitive championship, especially now I think the regional championship is a... It's a very good example with a with a great calendar, and um, where we are racing on all the pretty much the F1 tracks. So it's a good, let's say, preparation for the future. Um, so it's not, you know, you come to a new track and you you need to learn it on one F pre, uh, on a free practice and then qualifying straight away. So you know, it's a preparation for the future as well. Um, enough running, running time on on track before qualifying. And um, and so on, and as you say that the silverware this year it's been coming in um, quite well, and uh, I think it was in Zandvoort first uh, first race. I was not on the podium, and you know, not to be not to be like a jerk or something like that, but I really didn't know where to go. <laughs> you know, when I came into the pit lane, I was like. Shit, I forgot the procedure now. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was just trying to follow the other cars then. And uh, it was a bit weird. I, you know, I missed the the driver's weight and everything because uh, it was just, I was not so so used to it. Uh, uh, but I prefer it the other way that <laughs> to be on the podium is a bit easier. I would say that is a nice problem to have. That's the sort of thing. Yeah. And I, it's the same sort of thing, I suppose, for usual as well. And I'll talk about what's going on your championship a little bit, uh, in a little bit. But I just wanted to ask about Freca for you, how much is it on your radar in terms of watching or keeping up to date? But also, was it a consideration for you to go to this year? Because as Dino said, it's such a competitive championship that the level of people going into it, such a massive depth of the field, uh, was it something you had considered for this year or would consider possibly for next year? I mean, Freck was just a bit too much for our, for our budget because uh, just, you know, we just barely got away with GB3, really. And then uh, because this year has been going so much better than last year, because last year I did the uh, British F4 in, uh, yeah, in the UK, of course. Uh, I finished P4 with, uh, we had a bit of a struggle there, really. So unfortunately, we, I, you know, I thought we would be top three easily until we had, uh, had to do loads of work to just get the car where we wanted it to be. It just took took quite a while to get there. And then, uh, of course, the end of the season, we really we did pretty good, I think. And then uh, now with the GB3 was going so well, I think it's just mostly up to the team and my, my engineer and mechanics, really, because you know, I have Russell Dixon as an engineer now, and he's doing an amazing job. We have an amazing uh, partnership and just team of work works wonderful now. So, yeah, Freck was just a bit bit too much for us so hopefully we can just yeah you know get more money for for next year because we work with investors and stuff with that uh, lot so on the side of things and i know the money is such a difficult subject to talk about it's so personal to each driver but the question which i guess is a bit more universal with you winning so much or well taking the victories leaving the championship are you able to go and find the sponsorship opportunities a little easier this year compared to what you were doing 12 months ago yeah, I mean, of course, it's a lot easier now, and it's you know, we're doing so well. We're leading championship by like eleven points, which is basically nothing in GP championship because we have a bit of a different point system. It's you no know, thirty-five points for, for the win, and then don't don't tell anybody. Shh, you, you're, you're leading the championship. Let's leave it like that. <laughs> you be quiet for now, ten minutes. Then. Yeah, it's just, yeah. I mean, of course, can be easier now, and it's going going well. And you know, we already felt that now, and when the season isn't finished yet. So yeah. Hopefully we can do, do some other series next year. Well, interested to see where that heads into. Uh, just sticking with the Freca stuff for the moment, because there are South American races in Freca as well, Maria. Uh, we've got Dudu, Barrichello, of course, Sebastian Montoya, who I'm sure Dino knows pretty well, and previous podcast guest, Gabriel Bortoletto. All of them racing there, plus more as well. Uh, they're the three standouts for me. Is anybody in particular for you who is a standout for Brazil or the Americas that are racing in Freca this year that you and your uh, your people are getting excited for back on the home soil? 
Yeah, I mean, um, Gabriel Bortoleto, of course. I mean, he's doing an amazing season. And yeah, he's showing like great pace and everything. Uh, we were like immensely happy with his uh, win in Spa, but also Dudu, because um, from what I know, Dudu struggled a lot like last year, like moving to another country and everything, you know, he used to live in uh, the States and then he moved to Italy and it was like a total different, different you know, like lifestyles and everything. And um, to see him getting the the hang of the car and everything and getting used to the championship because he used to race like U, US, US up 2000. And um, he did pretty well there, but then he moved it to Italy and Freca and I mean, Freca is crazy. Uh, I mean, in a good way, of course. <laughs> Some good drivers driving there, I heard. Yeah, I mean, like Dino, like uh, Paul Aaron, like uh, Adrian David. And I mean, I mean, good stuff, you know, like good stuff. And um, to see him going to the podium, and yes, of course, it had all that trouble with you know, Gabriel Mini and everything. But um, it was like the comment of the Fedor, especially like not last weekend, but uh, two weeks before because it's so good to see him like on the podium and doing well and uh, yeah I mean everyone who is into the Brazilian world of motorsport knows the duel and knows everything that he he has gone through so yeah um, Gabriel Bortoleto and the duel are like my standout touch day. Yeah uh, Dido you're probably not so happy when you uh, see some of these drivers take the wins in uh, in Freca, but let's not focus on those. Let's focus on the future for you, because like you said before, there's only a couple of rounds to go, or a few rounds to go. Red Bull Ring, Barcelona, Mugello. You've raced on all of them from my research. What are you most ex Where are you most excited to go? And when are you going to win the championship? Well, my... Um... It's one of my favorite tracks, uh, Mugello. I've been um, really enjoying driving there. It's a high-speed track, and I and I really love it. I think we saw um, the magic when Formula One was running there. You could really see the the high-speed section, how how well the cars were handling, and the um, the um, sensation of the of the Formula One cars and the Formula cars in general. And it's uh, such a special track for me, but also Ferrari and Prema because it's uh, it's in Italy. So no, I'm definitely looking forward for that. And uh, I mean, yeah, we just need to keep uh, keep calm. I know um, maybe journalists don't like that uh, that saying, <laughs> but you know, it, it's the reality that uh, you need to keep calm, keep the head the uh, head down, and uh, not focus too much on on the championship and uh, not get stressed about it um take every weekend like it's a, it's a new weekend and uh, eventually hopefully potentially we will get there <laughs> there's so many caveats in that answer why didn't you just say i'm gonna go win the win the championship at red bull ring easily that would be much much I'm more not, <laughs> i'm not gonna say that i'm not jinxing it <laughs> No, of course not. This is Dina. You have uh, you've had such a good championship so far. And I tell you what, you're right. Some of the tracks you're racing on, all the Formula One ones that you've shared, it's such a good calendar. Um, Mugello, I do think not the best for overtaking, but it looks like an absolute roller coaster, dream sort of track. So I don't know when you're going to win the championship, but at the moment it looks like it's certainly going to be happening sooner rather than later. So just uh, best of luck for that. But we're going to focus on GB3 now because there's a certain driver, Joel, in the championship that's looking so tight who keeps taking silverware every weekend, uh, retaking the lead at the top. How do you feel that driver's season has gone? I mean, it's been an amazing season. I mean, you have finished P2, let's say I've finished P2 in the championship, I still think it's been the best season of my life. It's just amazing compared to, you know, a great battle with Luke now. Cal Voison has catched up a bit the last couple of rounds, but I think it's like 70 points behind or something, with my, which might be a bit too much. Unless, you know, me and Luke tangle sometime and we both DNF. 
then maybe it's back in back in championship. So just gonna make sure we finish the last couple of races and hope we can do it in front of Luke as well. Yeah, you've been doing well. There's a lot of tight championships in the moment. I mean, Formula Three in particular is outrageous. You guys seem to be doing a bit of a what would you call it, like a, a, a seesaw as well, kind of going back and forth a little bit. You've retaken the lead after, well, let's call it a sensational Silverstone. How are you thinking? It's two rounds left, right? Two rounds, six races. It's like you mentioned before, it's not a massive gap between it. Is it the same sort of thing from Dino that it's just trying to keep your head down, go into it race by race? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the last two couple of races, the brand Sash now coming up in a month's time, and then I've done it, done it on the last one. And those two are two tracks that's tough to take on. Hmm. So, both things can be crucial for, for the race weekend, really. And then it's just because qualifying is so important. I think we have good pace in qualifying so far this season. I think I have like four pole positions, I think. So I mean, we're not we're not uh, someone you, you can't count on in qualifying. So if we can just, just keep the qualifying sessions together, and as you said, with me and Luke, with the championship, it's just been going up and down this, this whole season. Really, he he took the lead with like twenty five points after Alton Park, uh, and I was like P four in the championship of the first round, and then. After Silverstone, I believe it's the second round. We just, uh, yeah, got back up, the, up into the lead, and then I think I got a, I think I had like three points ahead of him. And then after Donington, the, the next one, then I was like one point. So that was really close. Like one point is, I don't even know how we get there. Really. And then it's just been I had a good weekend at Spa a couple of weeks ago, where we pulled away a bit in the championship. But then we we took them right back now at Silverstone. It's such a close fought thing that you guys are having in uh, in there. And Dino mentioned some great tracks. It's not like you're not racing on some of the uh, the classic tracks as well from Formula One's history, but one of the ones, not so much from its history, but from the moment, uh, and sorry, just to focus on the finishing positions, but both your wins coming at Silverstone, uh, that last visit with the hallowed triple podium, it's not that common to see. Is that a coincidence or... Is just you something with the track that clicks and all comes together? Yeah, I mean, I like track with fast corners, like we have a Silverstone Spa as well. At the Spa height, it was just a bit too quick and, and browning as well. So we just couldn't do much about him. And now at Silverstone, we, you know, we showed our pace, we have a good pace. And then Brands Hatch, next one coming up, is a track I also like a lot. It's funny because me and Luke were actually doing some sim with, uh, at Vortec when he wasn't driving. Mm -hmm. It was like last year, I think. So we were driving against each other on the sim, uh, just racing each other a year, you know, a year later, we we're racing each other on the same track for the championship. So <laughs> something we didn't count. Is the next track, is it, is it the Brands Hatch GP layout or the Indy layout? Yeah, yeah, GP. Oh, very nice indeed. It's a, it's a cracker. Was that when you were doing the sim stuff, did you alternate or did you just uh, stick with the GP proper layout? No, I miss. We just do the GP. Now we have some test days. I think we have one test at Indy just to mm. get the first sector really. Because, you know, it's pretty important on the first one. And then obviously the second one where it's, cause it's tough to, to get like practice days at, at Brands Hatch, especially on the GP track. Because I think it's like they can't have too many test days a year. Mm. I don't know how many there is, but it's very hard to get test days around there because you have to go out all the way out into the forest and then you come back and I think there's like people living living there in the forest somewhere so they're not too pleased with driving so <laughs> it sounds like a good place to live for me but maybe not for some other people and there's something i have to ask as well and it's not meant to sound disparaging but your teammates haven't had the same level of success as you this season why do you think that is and do you think it is giving any disadvantages to you and your championship challenge when you're racing against the carlins and the high techs yeah, I mean, it's tough. Corin has three really good drivers. They're all usually in the top, like, seven or eight. And then I think both me and Luke are having a bit of a struggle with the teammates. But, you know, my teammates are working hard. They're doing the best they can. They, they've improved quite a lot from the beginning of the season. So, yeah, hopefully again, they can just keep on improving and, yeah, just get some points for the team championship as well. Because I think we're P4 now. But it's pretty close between the top, top two to top five, I think. So like two to fifth is very close. It really is. Um, Dino, I will have to say it's the opposite 
problem for you. I know you've obviously stretched ahead in the championship a little bit, but Paul Aaron has uh, kept you fairly honest. Is is it different, like a relationship that you've got this year with Paul compared to what you were having last year, considering you're both like championship challenges properly this year? Well, um, obviously it's it's a bit of a different situation. Um, it's his third year in the in the category. He's my second, so obviously last year he was already uh, a championship contender, and uh, for this year I think the only focus he has is uh, is winning and uh, coming so far into the season I feel like we have been um a step ahead of um of him um which you know if it's good like um I think every racing driver is the focus is first to be in front of the teammates and then maybe looking at the others um the other teams and the other drivers from the other teams but um yeah I think um Paul is, Paul is a very good driver. I mean, the result tells uh, quite a lot. You know, he's a Mercedes junior driver and we have been racing together since since karting. He made the move to, to Formula Cars um, one year earlier than me. But um, yeah, we are on the same, pretty much the same stage in the career right now. And um, I think, uh, like I said before, it's, it's a good championship. Everybody is trying to to prepare as much as possible, stepping up before uh, from La Free and from La Two, you know, it's it's a it's the same trend um, of car uh, as the from La Free and from La Two, you know, it's a bit heavier, mm-hmm. and um, you know, I would say probably Euro Formula or the um, what is it called GB Three, um, maybe the cars are more fun to drive because they are lighter. No, no, but like honestly, they are lighter. They, it's a bit you can do much more with the car, mm. but it's it's not the same advantage for the future when you step up and you get to the heavier cars, and then um, you know it's a different way of driving the car. Then, so um, I think that's what people are focusing on, and that's why I think the championship is is so competitive because everybody wants to go that way, and we can also see that. The, um, the F1 junior teams choose this way as well. So it must mean that, you know, it's the right way to go. Well, I've got to say that uh, a certain predecessor, potential predecessor, sorry, Joel, to, uh, to maybe jinx that, but a certain predecessor of the GB3 championships uh, doing Williams racing. But a question just about that, you talk about the car, Joel. You've got the newest car, I believe, from Tatis, right? And how, you were, was, it, was it my Gales you were racing last year? Sorry? Was it my Gale chassis that you were racing yeah. last year? What's the difference like going to this new this new car? Are you feeling that, like Dino is suggesting, like it's a lighter, racier car than what you're used to? Yeah, I mean, like compared to F4, it's two completely different cars. I also had, I think it was like two or three testers in the, in the old British F3 car, hmm. which was also just completely different compared to the new one. I think the folks a bit more on the floor, just, just like F1 has now just so we can be closer to each other during the races and have some more overtakes and stuff, which I think they've done a good job on because the, the last car, or last year's car, was pretty tough to stay close behind someone. But now it's relatively easy. You know, it's not like clean air, but it's not too bad either. So. And then it's a lot quicker as well. I think, I think we're like four or five seconds quicker on Spa now this year than last year. Now, last week, Michael McClure let us in on a, I'd call it a whistle-stop tour of F4 Americas because there just wasn't enough time. But because of that, we could barely scratch the surface. I quote from Michael here, Pedro Claro continues his impressive campaign with two wins and a second place at the first of two Interlagos rounds on back-to-back weekends. Probably butchering the name, Maria. Please tell me off if I'm saying that more French than I probably should. Uh, I know that F4 Brazil had another race this weekend. And there's a certain rumour, which I think you started at the start of the podcast, that you were there. What can you tell us? Well, it was a crazy weekend. Starting off because we now have a championship. Yes, Pedro Cotero is a championship leader and he's like 178 points. Okay. We got it, but we see some um, 
significantly like uh, development, let's say. On the first round in Village Top, we had like Pedro Claro and full time sports, like dominance. And Pedro, uh, he was the pole man in race one. And uh, we had also like Ricardo Gracia, who races uh, in Spanish up for like uh, winning races, I think race two, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, I mean, it was like uh, a race weekend for Pedro Claro and full-time sports, but uh, it was in May. And then fast forward like to last weekend of July, we had the second round in, in the, at Interlagos. And uh, it was uh, quite different because in the mid season, let's say, we had like testing in, like they tested the cars on the three like race tracks. So in Telagos, Goiânia and Village Ta. Village Ta is like a not it's like somewhat like um let's say Zonwood because it's not a, like a flowy track, it's more like the corners and everything. Uh Goiânia is a high speed track and in Telagos, you guys know. I mean I've seen it a few times, yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's Oh God, it's like a temple of motorsport here. And it, it's got like a mix of it all. So uh, they really saw the car like working on three different three different tracks. And uh, it made like a huge difference because last weekend we had like Cavalier Sports showing up. So we had Nick Giafoni and Vinicius Tessaro uh, on the podium twice. And this weekend, we had, like, uh, Nick Monteiro, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Nick Monteiro, with uh, three podium. And um, so he was, like, P3, P3, and P3. He almost won race three, but he made, like, a huge mistake on the last race of race three. I mean, it was, like, um, it was like he was in karting, and then he made, like, a basic mistake. And he he went from winning to third place. But okay, beside that, uh, we also had like a, a draw because differently from Europe, uh, the owner of the car is actually Vika. And Vika is the promoter of Formula 4, of Brazilian F4. So what happens is that um, they decide what they want to do with the car. So they they thought Pedro is like, way too fast we want to see if there is any difference with the cars if uh, is Pedro that talent or is the car favoring him so they did like a draw so uh, Pedro Pedro's car went to I don't know I think it was João Tesse and then Zucchini's car went to Nick Giafoni and everyone like they changed the cars like a chassis lottery yeah, just to show people because there were a lot of gossips and everything that oh no, it's uh, the chassis and the engines they are not the same. They are not the same. Auto Technica, Auto Technica is messing up with the engines. And oh. So just to shut everyone up, they changed the tires, the tire, the the chassis and the the engines and everything. But we now have a, like a championship, as I said in the beginning, because. Uh, we don't have like full-time sport dominating everything. We had like three podiums with three different teams. Mm. And yes, Pedro won. And now we have like Cycle with uh, his, look at the Cycle is a, oh, I was going to say he, he's Mineiro. It means that he hails from a certain place in Brazil. Uh -huh. But um, he's a good driver, but he didn't have the experience with the car until like February or even later than that. And now he's winning races. So uh, when I say that we have a championship, it means, yes, Pedro is like, I don't want to say it now, but I mean, it's almost crystal clear that he's going to win, but who's going to be the, the like, who's going to be the second, who's going to be the second in the championship, the third. We don't actually know because it's changing a lot. Uh, and um, yeah, I think these are like what I can tell you now and that what is new and from what I saw in the paddock. Maria, me being an F1 fan, 
I'm unfortunately mm -hmm. always drawn to names that I recognize and that generally means famous surnames. And I saw another Barrichello in F4 Brazil, uh, Fernando Barrichello. Is this only a famous name or is this a Fernando we'll expect to see in Europe racing maybe next year? Well, um, FFO is doing good and he's in a good team, full-time sports. And um, he his race, I mean, the, the race that he won, it was, was like uh, a brilliant driving that um, he made. And um, we still have got like some time to see. He hasn't really, he has evolved, but not that much, or at least not as much as his teammate did a little. But um, yes, I think we could see him in Europe, not in um, Frekov, let's say, like Dudu, but um, in some Italian F4 maybe, or, or Spanish F4. Uh, but I think it wouldn't take that long to see him racing Europe. Yeah, we see quite a lot of those famous surnames with racing Brazilian flags, don't we, at the moment? There's a lot of them racing over in Europe. And away from Brazil, though, <clears throat> it's not F4 Brazil as the only feeder series that you cover. There's also F4 mm -hmm. Argentina and F4 uh, NACAM. What mm -hmm. can you tell us about those championships uh, as a little shout out? Because I don't think we've heard much, if anything, about that in the podcast up until now. Yeah, so I don't really have any news regarding F4 Argentina, but regarding F4 NACAM, um, we have the, the next round, like in two weeks' time, let's say, on August 20 and 21st. And... Um, it's it's been a, like a, an interesting championship uh, for those who are not like following following what's happened. Juan Felipe Pedraza and Julio Rejon, and yeah, they're like fighting for the for the championship. And um, Juan has one hundred and twenty six points. Julio has one hundred and six three. So um, yeah, we're gonna see who's gonna you know, get the better results. And, but that's what we have uh, with the news regarding the, the series. We don't usually have like um, the news that easy because the, the, championship, the championships are not really well known. Uh -huh. Like they don't have the popularity like they, they do, like the European championships do. But yeah, that's what I got. Yeah, and we've got to actually do a shout out for the previous championship winner of Nakamura. Mm -hmm. We know Leon, who's now racing for Red Bull um, and going in for Eka as well. So we may see some names get promoted. And just a final thing about this, because we've obviously got two Swedes here championing their country. Let's give you a chance to celebrate Brazil's <laughs> F2 season. Not just Brazil, there's a lot of Brazilian drivers at the moment, but. I've seen so many Vamos messages on social media for a certain driver called Felipe Dragovic. And then recently, in particular recently, an increasing amount for a Mr. Fittipaldi, Enzo Fittipaldi. Is there an optimism in Brazil for either of these drivers or maybe some other drivers in the lower categories to be reaching Formula One anytime soon? Well, everyone here is having like a mixed feeling because uh, it's been amazing. Uh, seeing, you know, both Felipe and Enzo, like they're driving really, really well. And, and uh, but at the same time, regarding Felipe specifically, um, we're kind of worried that's the, that's the, what's happening because Tel Pusher is, you know, is Tel Pusher and Logan Sargent, dude, he, he's feature race win. He's, out of this world and they're both like affiliated to uh academy uh yeah academy so Tao Pusher with uh you know like Salve and Alfa Romeo and um Logan with Williams and Felipe with his talent you know so that is actually freaking us out and we don't really see a seat in, in F1, 
Um, but it's been wild. We did not expect that. Uh, from what I from what I know, Felipe did not expect that. Uh, I mean, of course, he wanted that, but he he I don't think he really put faith that it was gonna happen. But the thing is, he's got the hang of the car, and he feels good with the team. And Felipe has changed from last year to this year. From what I've seen from him, like face to face, even the way he like. He, he stands for himself. It, it has changed in a good way, and it's totally reflecting on the championship. So these are the feelings that we have. And regarding Enzo, God, what he's doing with that Shadows car, and that's what gets me the most, because um, his teammate, Chan, um, he did not have the, the experience, as you know, everyone knows. And um, it's sort of difficult to you know improve when you're a driver when you don't have like someone to compare let's say the data and Enzo is leading the team and um, he's like progressing you can see he's improving every every round so I always like ask you know myself and even like his brother like Pietro how does he do that how can he do that? I mean, what is going on? How? How? And um, the answer is just like talent and hard work. And I mean, that are the most like political and answers. Maybe journalists don't like that. But yeah, it's been a crazy year in a good way for Brazil. And we're enjoying it. But we have some stuff to be worried, as I said, with Felipe not being affiliated with any academy. Well, that's enough questions from us because the F1 Feeder Series podcast is for you, viewers and listeners. We're going to move on to the part of the podcast where you have your say with hashtag AskF1FS. A bunch of questions, so it happens every time. So sorry if we don't get through the wall. This week as well is like a bumper load of questions from popular drivers. But please keep on sending your questions in. If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter, joining our Discord and using the podcast questions channel, or simply commenting on our YouTube videos and ask whatever it is that's on your mind. Dino has the first question from a regular question asker, Liam Talks Motorsport, he wants to know how much of a pressure cooker is being a part of Ferrari's Driver Academy? I'm sure it's a question you've had before, but there's a lot of you in that Driver Academy. You know, um, I struggled a bit. I mean, I struggled quite a lot from um, from pressure in uh, in 2020 when I just joined um, the FDA and I just joined Prema. I just joined Formula 4. You know, everything was new. It was like starting from zero, to be honest. Um, building up my karting career and then basically starting from zero it felt like starting from zero um it wasn't easy and uh you know before karting is a whole different word so um you know talking with uh, with f1 teams and you know that was not really an option in karting because there's not so many opportunities and not a lot of junior teams want to make that step to to have a junior driver in karting because it's not really representative maybe for you know moving up to formula formula cars because you know some people adapt better for karting some people adapt better for for formula cars and um yeah i struggled a bit with it in f4 uh, especially in the beginning and then i wouldn't say i got used to it but i sort of um knew how to let's say control the pressure or like use the pressure instead of using the pressure for bad let's say bad pressure it was more like a good pressure like now or in the end of last year even last year when it was being tough I was using the pressure for good um, because you know in the end they are there to support me you know having a Formula 1 team as Ferrari the, the most iconic uh, team and one of the most like, iconic brands in the world, um, not only in, in motorsport, but uh, in all the brands. It's, uh, it's something special. And 
you know, it's not uh, it's not random that they that they choose me to be a part of their academy, and that's what I keep you know thinking about and let's say keeping me motivated that you know they are there to help me and not really anything else. They're not there to to kick my ass or um, you know show that um, yeah okay this you didn't do well so you know yeah. You know, how long, how long um, have you been in there? Is it, were you 15 or 16 when you first joined? I was six. Uh, well, I was 15 with two days to turn. <laughs> oh, yeah. So just let's say 15. That's a, bit, a better story. But it's so funny yeah. that just like the idea of a 15 year old. I know when I was 15, if I had a, a company like Ferrari backing me, it's I can understand why you'd have that pressure, but I can see what exactly what you mean why you'd ease into that because they're there because they want you to do well. So yeah, that's a well a well answered question. Um, there's a question which isn't necessarily about or for you, it's about you because this one comes from Stiv underscore F one. Dino is a known polyglot, which is a new word that I didn't know, but I like it. Uh, and you even know a little Russian. Has he learned any new languages recently? Is that right? Do you know a bit of Russian? What is uh, what, what's that word you said? Uh, so it's polyglot, which I believe is somebody who can speak multiple languages. Oh, okay. But like a multiple, well, not, not, not bilingual, like a lot of languages. Yeah. But, well, I, I don't speak fluent Russian, but, you know, in karting, I was in a, in a Swedish team mm -hmm. with Joachim Ward, but there was a lot of Russian drivers coming there um, with a partnership with the SMP Racing and a lot of mechanics, and um, <laughs> I sort of started re learning Russian before a Italian. Be honest, and... were you learning all the bad words? Because that's what I tend to hear from the from the racers, from drivers. Well, the bad words are the first <laughs> thing, you know. Then it started to develop, let's say. No, but, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. The bad words is the first thing you learn, and then, you know, it, it develops. But yeah, a little bit, I understand a bit of it. But, you know, I speak Swedish, I speak English. I would say I'm classified as uh, speaking Italian now. Um, I speak uh, Bosnian fluently. I speak all the time with my parents. Um, so I think also there are some similarities um, in the Russian language with the Bosnian language. Uh, and you just know how to swear at all the Russian drivers uh, as well when they're on the racetrack. But this question actually is more specifically about Joel and he wants to know what language is it you speak. So I presume English uh, from listening to some of your answers already. You got that one ticked. Swedish, is there any other ones that you've learned or are trying to learn? Well, I've, you know, I've been learning Spanish in school because I have to choose like, I think it's one of three. You can choose Spanish, fr uh, French and uh, German. Uh -huh. So, you know, I, I know a bit of a bit of Spanish, but I wouldn't say that I'm that I'm fluent on it in any way. It's just, you know, just uh, yeah, because I think I've done like three years of Spanish now. So, I know. Are, bit, you, are you still learning it now? No, not anymore. No. Are you still practicing it now? Not really. No, I mean, I kind of, kind of lost. <laughs> he gave up. <laughs> I know, so, so, I know some left, like, I know, I know the basics and stuff, so. You know all the swear words, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> uh, Dino's just laughing with his, uh, laughing in five different languages at you all at once, Sergio. Uh, <laughs> this next question's for both of you, but let's go with you first. You'll... A simple question, Simon, via Twitter, racing in F3 next year, question mark. Well, it's, it's a tough one. Of course, I would have an unlimited budget. I would definitely go for it uh, with the FIA free. And by looks of it from now, you know, it's tough to say it's so early. It's such a long time left to go. So, but I mean, if, like I said before, if we, if, if we get the budget for it, we should, I think we go for it, yeah. Because, you know, we want to make it to, to F1 and we want to be successful in, in there as well. So just trying to follow, follow the, the ladder as much as possible, really. Is there anything you have like with contingencies? Um, is that the right word? Probably not. But like in terms of like a sponsor potentially saying, if you win the championship, then X and we will help you. Or do you have anything? Do you have discussions with teams ongoing at this point? If you don't mind uh, me prying. Yeah, I mean we don't have anything with sponsors. Like oh, if you win this, you get X amount or something. Is 
like I said before, it's a lot of with the investors and stuff like that. And if you do good, they get uh, more motivated and uh, more inspired, I guess. So mm. then they might wanna put some more into it. And just yeah. So I mean, like I said, it's early days now. So I guess we'll I guess we'll see in a couple of months. Well, hope to see you there. Uh, having uh, both of you there would be excellent because I'm going to guess, you know, on the, the normal ladder that F3 next year is the target. Well, that's the, that's the goal. Um, well, it's not, um, I mean, obviously it's up to me, but it's not my work to do that. Um, Rickard is working on it and uh, the FDA and uh, working together with Prema. Um, Just confirm, Ricard, your manager. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ricard uh, Rydell, my manager, and uh, you know, they're doing everything to to make me have that opportunity for next year, and uh, and yeah, it would be um, it would be really good if we could do it uh, with the team with Prema. We have been there since uh, three years now already, and it would be really nice to continue our partnership and um you know we all know that prema has been uh, a successful team in formula 3 and uh, they have won so many years in a row so that would be uh, a very important step let's say like that yeah and then uh, certain isaac hajar and victor martens comes around to try and screw that all up so dino needs to go there and sort it out next year right that's that's the idea um a question here, another for uh, one from a regular question asker, CM Parfait 16. And let's go with you first on this, Yul. How interesting are the Le Mans hypercar and LMDH programs in terms of being a top level racing option for you guys to compete in in the future? Is it something that you're focusing on or is it just solely Formula One uh, as your target right now? No, I mean, like at the moment, it's just like Formula One. And then obviously if you, if you can't get there, it's... A lot of side options, but for now, I'm just interested in formal racing. So, if anything, you know, let's say that I don't think the Formula One thing, if anything, I would go to some other Formula series like, yeah, like Formula E. You have in the car, we have two Swedes racing, Mark Ericsson and Rose and Quist. So, They're doing all so right yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, did you did you watch the Indy? I presume you did. And uh, how how excited how exciting was that for you? Both of you, actually. Yeah, I mean, I usually follow all the IndyCar races because you know, I'm sharing on both, on both Sweden, especially now with the Marks had a great success at the Indy 500 where he won, actually. And he's doing great in the championship as well. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, following follow all the races. And then we have uh, Linus Lundqvist as well doing the mm -hmm. in the lights as well, doing pretty well as well. I think he's he leading the championship. I think so. I don't know at the moment, but I know he's been uh, doing extremely well at the top end. Uh, it's not only the Feeder Series podcast. What do you expect me to know that sort of stuff for? But yeah, the uh, the Swedish flag is waving pretty damn well. Uh, is this something as well for you, Dino? I don't know if Ferrari speak about this because they're obviously looking at that uh, endurance program that you would consider going into the tin tops or are you the same that it has to be single seaters or nothing? No, I mean, it's, uh, it's obviously an interesting project. I think uh, it's obviously the GT endurance um, side and carrier that you have to switch then if you make the switch. So I think all the driver's dream is first to become an F1 driver. And if you don't do that, it's more like um, maybe a secondary option. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a great, uh, great thing. Uh, it's a great thing to do if you don't uh, achieve it, or you know, some drivers already want to do that um, in early in early stages. But my focus is, uh, you know, step by step, and um, hopefully to get to Formula One. This next question is from JB Monahan via Instagram, and I don't know how I'm going to be able to react to this because it's not really going to be that helpful to. Uh, let's say the other 200 nations but what is your favorite swedish movie uh let's put you on the spot first dido and then go to go to your oh that's that's stuff um... i like when there's a question i knew it that you're not going to know what the answer is to start with i was thank i was thinking this is great well done jv monahan his face right now thank confused thank you thank you 
you make my life a bit uh, more difficult now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really don't know that many movies, but I have watched one, not fully finished, but I would say a standard one. It's Mamma Mia. A Swedish movie? Yeah, I guess that's Swedish, no? Yeah, it's the same one I thought of. It's the only one I could think of, Swedish. Oh my god, yeah, you've sent, you sent Maria to come, unless you can't even look at the answers. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess technically it is. I was thinking maybe something a bit more uh, artistic and independent, but I suppose technically. Is that your answer as well, Lindjol? Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if is this I, I, I wouldn't say favorite movie, but I would say movie. Uh, it's not the favorite, of course, but I'm so bad at movies and stuff, so. The only one I can think of. Oh, wow. Mamma Mia, what an answer. Uh, yeah, that's uh, for the benefit of anybody who's listening. Uh, we had to have Maria. She's muted herself because she was laughing so much at the ridiculous answer. Um, thank you, guys. That's not what I expected. What, what did you expect? I, I mean, I was expecting to say something with a Swedish title that I couldn't pronounce with the little O's over all the letters and stuff and be like, oh, yeah, it's this brilliant movie that all Swedish people love. And then you come out with a musical uh, that you said, Dino, yourself, that you've not even finished watching. <laughs> you said it's your favourite Swedish movie. Yeah. Um, this one's from, oh, I don't know how to pronounce it. B-U-C, yes, 30. I've got that pronunciation perfect. Who's your biggest supporter? Uh, Joel, let's do this one for you. Well, I think it's probably my parents and then... Uh... I know my grandpa is, is also a very big supporter. He's, I mean, he's like always on the stream. He's like waiting like 10 minutes on the YouTube, on his phone, like wait for the YouTube uh, live stream to start. He's a hardcore fan as well. But I think, yeah, for my parents and then uh, and all the people that I work with now as well, you know, big supporter as well. Just you knowing the team as well. Is there a name that we can do a shout out if it's that much of a, I think it's your grandparent I'm talking about here, your granddad. Is there, if it's that much of a supporter who I presume might be watching or listening to the podcast? We have my, my grandpa, my Pekka. Yeah. He's, well, I think he's probably the, the biggest one, I think. Well, so my big, parents are doing a lot of work and yeah. A big shout out. So if you're listening or watching, uh, Round of applause. That's uh, Joel's very, very thankful for that. Dino, how about yourself? Your biggest supporter? Is it one of the, um, let's call them obsessive Instagram fans that you've got? And you've got quite a few that are, are big, big supporters of you there. Or is it somebody a bit closer to home? You know, I would say um, for my family for um, political reasons. <laughs> Not inside the family. <laughs> I will not rate them who is first, who is second, and who is third, because it will be some uh, some discussions for that. If I rate my mom second, or if she, you know, I, I will not go, go into details, but, you know, I know that Joe is a huge fan as well. Um, but, yeah, you know, I will not rate them in, uh, in top five. Any argument from that, Joel? Are you the number one fan of Dina? Oh, I'm definitely number one, yeah. Definitely, easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine then, Dino. Mom's number two, Joel's number one. That's fine, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we keep it quiet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I will not uh, get the keys for the house next time I get home. <laughs> you have to go and stay with Joel instead. Um, I think mean, this question was specifically for Dino, but I'm going to have it to both of you. This is from Olga. In your opinion, what is your biggest strength one as a driver and two as a human being. Um, and I guess this one has to go to you, this one, Dino. Thank you and good luck. So biggest strength as a driver and then biggest strength as a human being. You know, I think it's a, it's a good question. Um, I think as a driver, um, I have the ability to adapt quite easily um, to whatever, you know, the condition new cars, um, different balances in the car. Um, and I think that's a strength I have uh, since since karting, um, which is, you know, obviously important if it, you know, starts raining in a race or 
you don't get the the balance exactly where you want for a race. You know, there's different uh, tricks here and there you can do to to make the car um, stable. Maybe not the not the way you want to drive it, but a way to not be slow. Let's say. Um, and I would say that's that's on track, off track. I would say. I would say I'm quite easy going. I was going to say, was it was it movie watching or something? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know that's easy easy going. You know, I haven't <laughs> watched it. I haven't finished watching Mamma Mia because you know I'm easy going. You know, I'm open for options. You know, <gasps> maybe I fell asleep during the movie. You know, you never know. But you know, it's easy. You know, maybe I'm easy to adapt there as well. I tell you something. I did not expect the podcast to go down this route, but I'm I'm all here for it. How about yourself, Joel? What's uh, biggest strength as a driver and as a human being? Can you complete movies? Is that your biggest strength as a human being? Maybe I don't know. I mean, I'm not too well finishing movies either. If I'm going to be honest, <laughs> but I think like, on track, I think it's like I'm I'm a pretty quick learner, so. Like if I get a get onto a new track, I can learn it pretty quickly. And same with the car as well, which uh, we saw this year in the pre-season testing, where yeah, yeah, you just understood almost everything from from the beginning, really. And then in in real life, I'd say I mean, it's, it's a tough one. You've had longer real to life. think about this, so you need to have a good answer. Yeah, yeah, the pressure is on now. Uh, I mean, real life, I guess. Finishing movies then, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that is a cop out and a half, Joel. Dino's shaking his head. <laughs> I smell cap. Come on. I need a better answer. I can't let you go off the podcast right. with that sort of answer. Are you a chef? Is it something like that? I guess I'm easy to talk to in real life. You know, I'm up for conversations and stuff like that. So. Well, I can attest to that. You're uh, apart from some terrible answers, including Mamma Mia and copying Dido, uh, that you are pretty easy to speak to. Um, let's go with this for a final question as well, just to find out where it's gone. Here we go, Checo. I don't know if it's Mr. Perez or not. I'm gonna let's assume it is. So Checo via Discord. Question for both of you: What is one of your career highlights so far? Joel first, seeing as you got to answer the last one second. Well, I think it has to be now this, this last weekend at Silverstone when we had the, all three races on the podium. The first one we, we won, of course, and then the second one we finished P3. And also in the last one, we started P18, I think, and also finished P3. It was just crazy race. Just It was just an amazing race to drive it. It's like gaps just open everywhere. And I, just, I just went for it. So. Can I ask a question that you said you're back home at the moment for, um, for the, the break? Do you send your trophies back? Like, where are they at the moment? Because you had three trophies to go away with from that weekend. Where are they at the moment? Well, I got, I gave the, the one when I won. I won. Uh, I gave, I gave that one to my engineer. So he has the, oh. the P one trophy, and then I have the the P three at home now. As in back home in the UK or where you are right now? No, back home in Sweden now. And do you travel with that, like in your luggage, or do you just bring it on, like a on the plane as as, as a hand lock, as you put in the, the overhead locker? No, I just put it in the in the luggage really, and then we just, yeah. I mean, it's, sometimes it's tough because you usually get stuck in the when you send it through the the X ray thing. <laughs> yeah, and if it metal, this massive <laughs> trophy. I like, what is this kind of weapon? And then you have to explain <laughs> what it is. And then, yeah, I mean, <laughs> sometimes it's tough, but usually works out the behind the scenes stuff that you don't usually get to see and the other sorry Dino I know you did answer the question as well I just got so invested on this trophy story and the other what six seven trophies you've got this season are they all being handed out to engineers you're like oh, I've got another one here you go yeah I gave the I think I gave one of the trophies to the team manager so Ole Dutton so he has one of them as well and then I have the rest at home now in Sweden yeah. Well, I'll have to do a giveaway for some of the podcast listeners to get one of Joel Grand Force's trophies, so how frequently you dish them out. Uh, Dino, what have your career highlights so far? And is it going to happen in about two months' time? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, uh, hopefully, you know, I'm going to answer the highlights. 
the I would say the highlight. I really must say Monaco. The my my victory in Monaco this year was um, definitely something a highlight for this year. But also, I think whatever happens in the future, I think that will be a uh, one of the top. You know the my first win in Monaco. Uh, hopefully, one out of many. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I would uh, I would definitely put it uh, first. You know, it's um, just taking pole in Monaco. I think mm. always the Saturdays. You know what they call it in Formula One, the qualifying day, is one of the most exciting. You know, you need you, <laughs> yeah, with the Monaco flag there. No, but you you know you show them your your pace, your where you are, and to take pole in Monaco, not only. Pole, all, but only, I mean, Wiki Tens was uh, was was epic, and uh, then to take the victory on Sunday before the Formula One race, and I was uh, I had the opportunity then after as a little um, as a little as a big uh, big gift from um, the Ferrari family. I got to sh uh, see the race from the from the garage, yeah. uh, which was uh, really nice. I spent the day there. In the hospitality and uh, then in the garage for the race. So, no, I would definitely put it first. Sounds like a really tough weekend, all in all, Dino, just uh, watching the Formula One race from hospitality and winning the races on the Grand Prix weekend. That's, um, yeah, that'll be, that'll be pretty tough to beat, even if you grab this championship. So, no, I can understand that, that answer. It's not that easy because we need to wake up so early in Monaco. Oh, because, cry yeah. me a river, get to watch the Formula One for free <laughs> and you have to wake up early. That's that's tough. <laughs> now, listen, <laughs> so, you know, as a support even, we get not the best times on the track. So, and also in Monaco, it's a bit difficult with the, with the places to find the, you know, hotels and sleep. And even our paddock is in France. So we need to drive the cars from France to, to the center of Monaco which you know it takes time just that and you know you need to be on track around one and a half hour before driving the cars there and when you drive the cars there you need to wait another 40 minutes until the session starts so i think the wake up time in, in monaco was around five o'clock in the morning leaving the hotel at 5 30 to go to the track so you know i have my rights to complain about that I will just have to point out to all the other listeners who have camped at a racetrack for general admission and want to get the best ticket possible, the best seats possible, sorry, I'd have to wake up at 4.30 at a rainy campsite that tough Dino Boganovich has to wake up early to drive his Formula car to the Monaco Grand Prix to get onto the hospitality at Ferrari. And life is very difficult for the Freca Championship leader. Don't, don't believe just the Instagram stuff. He has to wake up early every once in a while. Tough life, Dino. <laughs> now you make me look here bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing. No, I have heard the, the, the paddock's like really far away as well. I have heard that before. Okay, but I'm afraid that is all the time we have this week. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. And if you'd like to have your question asked in a future episode, use the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter. Drop any questions below if you're watching on YouTube. Or let us know what questions you have on your mind on our Discord. Look for the podcast questions channel. And if you are watching on YouTube, dropping a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel all really helps us out. If you are listening, leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated. And finally, check out f1feederseries.com for more Feeder Series insight and follow F1 Feeder Series 1, F1 FS Americas and F1 FS Live on Twitter. You can find the links to all of those, plus the Twitter accounts myself and everyone else in the podcast in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we have been the F1 Feeder Series podcast. Goodbye. Oh, my God.